we're going to continue. Will and this will require innovation. innovation. And Both those we can harness today and those that we're in this together. And what each of our nations... Dangerous greenhouse gases are at levels not seen. Uh, Welcome to the Climate Center. Climate Action Pathways. We have carbon emissions. Uh, 13. Climate Conversation with Kamal Choudhury. Today, we are going to discuss the outcome of US President Joe Biden's Convent Leaders Climate Summit on Earth Day, April 22 and 23rd. Barcelona. He has invited 40 world leaders, head of the states and governments, including our Prime Minister, Bangladesh Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, Bhutanese Prime Minister, and many other leaders. Today, we have a very strong panel. All are seasoned negotiators including COP19 President Martin Korolek. We are very pleased to have him with us today. And also we have some veterans of Rio, Bryce Lalonde from France, who has been in uh, Rio drafting the Rio Conventions, all the three Rio Conventions in the INC days. And we have Peter Bears, legendary British negotiator, UK negotiator, who has been a lead negotiator for European Union for very many years. We have had a lot of fond memories of those negotiations. We have Paul Woodkinson, Martin Hessian from EU, Kabe, Katie, Johir Poki, the G77 and China uh, lead finance negotiator with us. We have World Resource Institute, uh, David Wasko, director. He has also hmm, with him wisdom. And we have also from Oxford, Tom Hale, Professor Tom. He also would like to share with us his reflection. And we have another veteran, Dr. M. Asaduzzaman of Bangladesh, who has been in the process for quite long. And we have Bangladesh Environment and Climate Secretary and our leader of the delegation, Ziaul Hassan, NDC. So with this end, we have Ira Friedman, who has been in the process, following this process for very many years. Uh, and he is now specializing in adaptation. Adaptation leader mm, uh, is uh, his organization right now. What mm, we would like to do, mm, an assessment of what happened in the virtual leaders climate summit on Earth Day. April 22 and 23rd. With the return of United States to the Paris Agreement, mm -hmm. whether this summit galvanized the momentum, required momentum, whether United States knew, uh, say, NDC or announcement of uh, cutting emissions by 50 to 52% is enough or not enough, we should uh, also mm, try to assess that, whether mm, it is realistic, whether mm, they can also reset up it. And also we have uh, heard from Britain that they are also going to mm, cut back their emissions by 78% from uh, by 2035. It was earlier, mm, uh, they have moved it forward. And also a couple of other countries declared their emission reduction targets 
raise their ambition but still we have a lot of gaps huge gaps to leave a live the paris agreement 1.5 degree centigrade target vision goal so how we are marching forward to glasgow come november i would now like to request france ferries ambassador france who is chair of the environmental integrity group uh, to initiate a conversation climate conversation and assessing the climate leaders summit thank france. you thank you very much conro uh, thank you very much also for for uh, allow me to to join that distinguished group of 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 colleagues and friends um i would like just to make three points in reaction to the um summit that uh, biden was was uh, invited for first um i think it was really a very positive signal to have the us back with commitment and with engagement that's that's really very important for the process my minister during a ministry round table that john kerry was organizing last friday uh, in the context of of the summit said it also very clearly this signal is really needed this signal a signal that is needed for everybody to show that one of the biggest emitters is back in the framework but it is also a very important signal for example for the population of switzerland because the population of switzerland will have to vote in june on the new co2 legislation in switzerland uh, outlining for the next decades uh, the efforts of switzerland to reduce its emissions and such signals that show that the biggest emitters such as uh, the us and china are also engaging in the international regime are also a very important signal to the population of countries like switzerland that we are not alone in our efforts uh, that we are part of the bigger pictures and that it is worth to to move forward second i think it is also a very positive signal to see again the cooperation between the us and china taking place towards a good outcome in glasgow that is very positive but at the same time i think it is also important to underline that we cannot leave the solution of the climate change problem to the two biggest emitters we will also need engagement of the small countries like switzerland which is responsible for less than 1. Point uh 0.1 uh, of the percentage of the global emissions like the ldcs uh, like the, uh, all of those countries who are responsible for little emissions but who are suffering a lot from the impact of climate change these countries have also to engage into the process and the third point i would like to make is that we really need an ambitious outcome on mitigation on article 6 on concrete measures on adaptation on a forward looking approach towards financing at glasgow at the upcoming cop in order to get there to a robust and ambitious and positive outcome we need a good process that engages all of us right now independent of the fact whether we can meet physically in person or not we need to work we need to use the tools that we are, that are available to us and that means virtual meeting the summit which was also a virtual meeting has showed it it's possible let's use that tool to make sure that in glasgow in november we are able to agree on a robust outcome thank you very much thank you all the for all three points um, well taken i think uh, you said that tone uh, but uh, you didn't mention uh, loss and damage <laughs> which is also a concern of great concern of least developed countries and also small island developing states and other developing vulnerable countries uh, zahir fakir uh, do you want to comment zahir. on that as well yeah uh, if, i'm if, happy to comment on okay. i think that is also okay. something that will be discussed i think we have the review of the different uh, machinery that yeah. has been in place in warsaw, warsaw okay. yeah. an important uh, success of warsaw and we have to make sure that this machinery is working that is delivering and that it is addressing that huge challenge that loss and damage is opposing but we have to make the machinery work uh, before just uh, changing the machinery again thank you i think you can join again 
if you uh, can uh, have a year meeting over, then you can return to that, like United States. <laughs> thank you. <Jai. laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Jai, can you hear me, Jai? I can hear you, Kamru. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we hear you. Hmm. Good to see you and good to see all the colleagues. Uh, uh, there. Maybe uh, I think uh, you want me to reflect on the outcome of uh, the Biden summit. Hmm. Uh, you will know that we've had many summits. And I yeah. think uh, the mood that is currently out there is everybody's desperate for something positive. Right. So everybody will be looking for something positive. And, and, and what has come out of the summit is a, a positive step. The question is whether it's enough or not. That will be uh, you know, up to us to see. But I think uh, one thing that one needs to also bear in mind is that there's this often misunderstanding of uh, what are we trying to achieve. Um, you know, and there's also a misunderstanding of uh, this notion that uh, we see summits and everybody's all excited things are going to happen. Uh, there's a famous quote from Nelson Mandela, which says yeah. that, you know, action without vision is passing time. Vision without action is daydreaming. You need a combination of both vision and action. Yeah. Because vision and action will change the world. And, and that's partly of the problem. We have a lot of summits. We have a lot of pledges. But at the end of the day, what happens in reality is what counts. Uh, and... Uh, we just have to look at all the examples of everything. Uh, we, if we talk of climate finance, we've noticed that there's drastic decline in climate finance. Uh, there's a shift in responsibility in climate finance. And whenever we raise these issues, nobody's addressing the non-fulfillment of the obligation. Everybody's saying, oh, well, go and look at the private sector. That's where the money is. Uh, you know, there's no argument that, the, that we are making that there is no distinction between private and public and both is required in that. But it's at the end of the day, the obligations that we make and whether our contributions to the process are within the context of the common but differentiated responsibility, whether we can recognize things like historical responsibility and whether we're making a fair share towards the global effort to reach the 1.5, et cetera. Uh, I can talk much more on the finance things that have uh, come out of the Biden uh, uh, summit. Uh, they released a paper on finance. And to be quite honest, I'm trying to be optimistic. My heart tells me I shouldn't be uh, because it's very much of what I've seen before. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of talk of a lot of new finance, but when you drill down to the detail of it, uh, you look at the climate finance paper of the Biden administration, not once do they mention the UNFCCC. Not once do they talk about their obligation to provide finance. They talk of a uh, role in mobilization. Uh, it's also a channeling of finance through their own domestic institutions. Uh, it's about providing support that support benefits uh, the American economy and supports and benefits American jobs. Uh, so then I asked the question, you know, were they really gone? Are they really back? Because when I was in Madrid, I was negotiating with the Americans. Uh, they were participating in every negotiation on finance. They never really uh, were not away. And what is being presented right now seems very great in, you know, in, in language, but it, it's devoid of detail. So the climate finance things talks about doubling their contributions but it doesn't give you a baseline of what the actual contribution would be. Uh, they talk of going to seek congressional uh, approval for meeting the areas in the GCF, but you know very well as I do, uh, if you look at history, the G, uh, in the GEF, the US is still in arrears since Jeff II, which was almost mm -hmm. 20 years ago. They haven't fulfilled that. Uh, they haven't made any announcements about any new contributions to the multilateral system in terms of the multilateral funds. So, you know, recapitalizing their own institutions uh, to further US foreign policy it may be great, but is that what is uh, needed in the multilateral process is another question. Okay. I, so, I'm yeah. concerned that uh, nothing is being mentioned about adaptation. And in fact, what is striking is that when you talk of adaptation, 
they qualify it with the language of saying, well, within the context of funds being available. Uh, you know, so again there, it does not show or demonstrate a seriousness about scaling up money on adaptation. No talk of loss of damage. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I doubt very much that we will get a seriousness in terms of addressing loss and damage. But I will stop well, there because I don't want to be negative. Yeah. I want to be <laughs> positive. Yeah. No. Uh, thank you, Zahir, for flagging a couple of issues. Uh, uh, true uh, that uh, the summit didn't uh, mention adaptation in that way. Uh, more or less, it tried to uh, flag it uh, as a question of resilience. Uh, not that OA adaptation uh, and no mention of uh, loss and damage. Uh, that is oil taken. Uh, I would now like to uh, request um, Paul. Paul has uh, already mm, summarized uh, the outcome mm, in a mm, short uh, uh, report. Uh, so, Paul, what is your take? Uh, I have gone through your <laughs> uh, face. So you have flagged in a couple of mm, issues. And um, so very briefly, mm, you can pass on uh, that. OK, well, well thank you, Cameron. And I'll, I'll be very brief, because I, I think I'd, I'd like to listen to everyone else. I think the, the, it's, it's the exchange which is valuable. And there are so many of us. I don't know how you're going to manage that. Um, <laughs> don't uh, worry. <laughs> I, I, I think the. I mean, I, I think between France and Zahir, I think we already have a lot of the sort of reactions I think many of us share. Um, it was one, very good to see the US coming back at a high political level, pushing hard, uh, coming in with a commitment uh, in their new NDC, uh, coming in with uh, a return on, on, on financing, despite all the, 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 the caveats that Zahir rightly points out as to, to what that says. Um, but at the same time, I, I think there was a the sort of summary by, by Climate Action Tracker afterwards saying that in terms of the overall impacts, we've, it sort of changes, the, reduces the gap by I think 12 to 14% uh, percent of the, the gap compared to what's needed. Uh, and clearly the, the major announcements, there were some, um, but we're still uh, far away from a pathway to one and a half degrees. So I think to see it as a starting place for the sort of political heavy lifting, which is needed uh, to really bring the sort of scale of effort and uh, ambition and, and transition, uh, which is needed is vital. I, I think it's clear it also, the, there is a lot to be done around the finance side, uh, the issues of vulnerability and adaptation and loss and damage, which you've highlighted, were, were less present uh, and will clearly have to be thought through uh, a great deal more in terms of implementation and action. And I, I'm not thinking just about COP26 here moving forward to there. I'm thinking in terms of the implementation and the real world yeah. we're moving yeah. in. But I think there was one point I, I just want to, to highlight, which struck me, which I, I thought was, was very positive in the summit, which was a real accent put on uh, the social dimension and the just transition. Uh, I think quite a lot of that seemed to be targeting the internal US side. And, and maybe one of the issues of the summit was how far it was really an international summit and how far it was looking for internal US uh, yeah, viewers and participants as much as the rest. I'd be interested in uh, US participants' yeah. views on that. Yeah, um, but I think that social side and the just transition came out much more strongly uh, from this. And I think that's a good thing as we move forward because we've always treated it far too much as a sort of secondary issue. Uh, and yet that's where a lot of the real challenges in implementation are. That's why we often run up at a national level against things we, that stop us from acting. Uh, and I think taking that more seriously as we move forward is a, is a signal which is positive. Thank you, uh, Paul. I would now like to uh, request our COP19 uh, COP president, Martin Korolek. Hmm, uh, we had a lot of fond memories of uh, Warsaw. Hmm, you not only posted us, but also hmm, you tried to uh, frame the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. And before that, uh, you hold the first annual adaptation forum.
because I was uh, co-chair of uh, that uh, group uh, from on behalf of adaptation committee, and uh, we proposed, and you uh, readily accepted that and uh, try to um, mobilize a lot of people uh, from uh, Sir uh, Nicholas Stern to um, uh, many legendary uh, figures uh, you have invited uh, in that uh, first annual adaptation forum in Warsaw. So um, we had a lot of fond memories. Uh, Martin, how you um, foresee the OA towards uh, Glasgow from your experience and vis-a-vis the, -vis, uh, the uh, summit? First, uh, thank you for for the invitation and uh, um, I'm outside of uh, negotiations for, for, for a while and trying to follow EU internal discussion on, on climate. Uh, so, but I'm quite quite far from, from international negotiations. Uh, my personal take about this summit is that first, happy that US is back. And the challenge they are facing, I think, is first domestic and second international. And after years of uh, uh, Trump, they need to change the language internally. And they are doing that with um, infrastructure package, with uh, declarations about um, uh, uh, CO2 electricity by 2035, by climate neutrality reductions, etc. Uh, I think a very positive step that they organize a meeting. Uh, they need to build a trust as a as a country, not only as great president and the great individuals like uh, climate and Roy Kerry, uh, they need to, to, to build a trust. But I think that declarations about climate finance is part of it. And we will see actions like Zahir said, uh, how, how, how that will translate into, into, into actions. Um, from mobilization point of view, I saw a bit of mobilization also in the European uh, level as uh, in the eve uh, for, for this uh, summit, we had a, a inter institutional agreement on the climate law, uh, which, is, which is a very good element as an internal EU mobilization. Um, let me say a word about Polish, Polish intervention. That was deceptive. I was not uh, was very, very unhappy with Polish president, with uh, his declarations. But uh, uh, my personal understanding is that uh, everybody in Poland already understands that uh, the call is no more future. The politicians, especially this government, has difficulty to, to pronounce it. <laughs> that, is, that is a way to to admit and to to, to pronounce it. Um, so I am saying it that reality will be faster than language here. Um, that is that is that is my 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 take. But overall, I think. Positive that they organize it. Uh, and I think that transatlantic cooperation in climate issues with the assistance and, and participation of China will be very good fun, 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 founding start for, for, for the Gladstone. Thank you. Thank you um, for, for your take. I think uh, now I should uh, ask uh, Peter. Peter Bers, uh, you have been in the process <laughs> as a veteran. So what is your take? What is your reading? How do you assess? And what are the shortcomings? What are the shortfalls, deficits? Uh, how we can cover up that 
in our road to Glasgow and beyond. Well, thank you very much, Kamrul, and it's great to be here with you and with so many Bangladesh uh, colleagues. Uh, worked very closely with Bangladesh over the years. I think veteran is a nice way of saying old. <laughs> no. anyway, in a positive way. <laughs> It's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can agree with much of what has been said. So just three points for me. Um, the first is you know, it's great that the U.S. is back, and I do think that we should celebrate. You know, a significant um, closing of the gap. Nothing like enough, but you know, twelve to fourteen percent, as Paul said, of the gap for maybe a quarter of the gap for two degrees. That's that's significant. Um, and I, we also got Korea committing to no new international coal finance, which I think was good. Um, I suppose second point is, you know, some countries did not yet announce uh, significant revisions to their targets. And it's not to pick on China. It's not to demonize China, but they are bigger than the US, the European Union and Japan put together. What they do just matters more than anybody else. And, you know, we had a very modest offer from from China. So, you know, we must really hope that China significantly raises their ambition if if we are to get on track for climate goals. That's it, it, we need that. We didn't hear from others too. Um, we all understand that India is facing very tragic circumstances at the moment. Uh, but others others too we didn't we didn't hear from yet. Uh, the third point was on finance and others have touched on this. You know, we didn't have much on finance and on the 100 billion. It's certainly a concern that we are not on track to meet the, the 100 billion dollar mobilization goal. We had a, an offer from the US to raise their finance, which is a good first step, I would say, uh, include, to double their finance and to um, in, triple their share of adaptation. But so it's a first step, but we will certainly need more from them and others to get back on track for, for the 100 billion, including the, the, a significant scaling up of adaptation finance. And of course, we have to address loss and damage. That wasn't the focus of the meeting yesterday. I understand that. But as the meeting that Shah, Mr. Sharma, the incoming president designate, called in the UK a few weeks ago, we clearly have to address all of these issues uh, in, in the COP in Glasgow. Thanks, Kamal. Thank you. Uh I will come back to you again. Uh, Dr. M. Asad Jaman. Asad thank you, Kamrul, and mm. uh, thank all the colleagues, many of whom I have not seen for a couple of years now because of this uh, Kamrul's initiative. We see each other again. And um, okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> as it applies over the globe. How does one react to this leader summit? It may seem a kind of shot in the arm, true, but it may be like the shot for COVID. One dose may not be enough. Second dose, not even second. Really <laughs> doesn't know. There is still uncertainty. And some might even develop clots. You see, things will get stuck. Somebody had been referring to Rio. It's almost 30 years since then, and how far have we progressed? It's a really snail space. Okay, the leader summit will, of course, there will be new pledges, and as people have already said, there will be, these will have to be translated into action, but the action is not only on the, in the field of mitigation uh, and limiting the temperature to 1.5. Even if all these pledges are, implemented, uh, which is doubtful. There will be all kinds of uh, monkey's range thrown into this when the COP actually opens. I had had my own belly full of experiences of uh, negotiating in the negotiation room. So I'm not that hopeful yet, uh, but we'll have to try. But the main problem is, this is, the, this is the thing that I would like to stress, that even if we have all these pledges implemented, even then climate change 
will continue. It has already started in many places with major adverse impacts on the lives and livelihood of people. In the last for this seven or 10 years, yesterday was the hottest day in Bangladesh, 42 degrees centigrade. And a lot of uh, paddy in fields are burning out. So what is going to happen in future? I don't know. Right now it's already happening. Okay, it's only 0.8 to 0.9 degrees you have advanced. Even then, this is because of the fluctuation in temperature and the uncertainty of rainfall and that, that will continue for decades to come. See, my children's children's children will still suffer. So that is, that is the thing we'll have to think about, not simply what can be done with money and technology and all that, but adaptation. And exactly how do we do that adaptation? Like today I had been thinking, Supposing that we have a crop failure somehow or other, and also it happens in other countries, there are also heat strokes, uh, heat spells and things like that. And during this period of COVID, when we are already, I think, uh, struggling in many cases, my neighboring country, India, is struggling heavily. Fortunately, we have not yet got to that stage and hopefully will not, but it is already serious. And would the leaders in such country give adequate time to what they think is a longer term problem? Though it is already here, it's no longer a longer term problem. It's already here and now. So that is something that we will have to think about. And when the COP26 actually convenes, those in the, I think the room who would be negotiating, they will have to keep this in mind. Just don't go about, you see, I have seen it, the umpteen time, one word, we had been struggling day after day to remove that word. Somebody is saying nothing doing, I will not take it out. And as the, as the, as the COP, COP principle is, nothing is agreed unless everything is agreed. Everything is agreed. That created, creates the problem. I think there should be some kind of change in the rules. See, that is, that is something that I hope that will happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, climate change is uh, now here, right here, mm, uh, right in every corner mm, of the globe. Tom, what is your take? Thank you. I have little I can add at this point in the discussion because of everyone's very astute observations so far, but I would underscore, I think, uh, Dr. Asadizman's last point on the importance of the urgency and the seriousness of where we are and, and you know, correspondingly the need for even greater results from any summit, um, even one okay. we're very happy that could take place to usher in a change in US policy. Let me just mention three things that maybe haven't been um, emphasized as much so far to um, try to round out the conversation. Um, first, on the on China's um, contribution, I think it's very interesting um, uh, and notable that China, of course, was present and, and at the highest level in the summit and certainly bodes well for further steps in this direction. And it follows a, a, what I found to be a very surprisingly positive joint statement between the US and China the previous week on the end of John Kerry's visit to Shanghai. Um, and of course, it came after a phone call between Emmanuel Macron, Angela Merkel, and President Xi um, on Friday, uh, the week before the summit, which ended up with actually quite a significant announcement. China saying it would ratify the the um, the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, um, the biggest, you know, about half of the benefit, climate benefits from that that uh, amendment come from, would come from China. So it's a very significant announcement for for the climate. Um, and even though China was, of course, very eager to not make this announcement on um, US Zoom soil, so to speak. Um, it's very notable that it came after John Kerry's visit with a meeting with the Europeans and right before the summit. So this really, I think really shows how a mix of cooperative and, and competitive um, elements can still yield quite good outcomes for the climate um, in this new geopolitical context. And I think we can uh, offer a much more fertile ground to build on than I think I would have thought even the week before that, that meeting came. So that, that was encouraging to my mind. Second point um, I just like to mention is 
notable how when the United States is reintroducing itself to the world on, in climate policy with the new Biden administration, it really did continue to make a strong point of emphasizing the contributions of US states and cities and businesses, and now increasingly labor groups, tribal associations, really all of society in a really kind of co-owned way. Um, there's a big section of the summit devoted to those, those actors and their contributions. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to see how that continues to develop going forward. The big goals that the Biden administration has laid out will of course require federal power and ideally legislation to achieve, but will also require the participation of, of all those other actors as well. And if we look down the road to how credible these targets will be, not just during this administration, but in the next one, and the one after that, and the one after that, and the one after that, all the way toward yeah. net zero by 2050, you know, that kind of all of society commitment will be really important for um, making or breaking the case for it. And I, I think that's quite significant to see in the US context as well. And the final piece of that was a big announcement on the eve of the summit, by 43 major global banks as part of this new UN convened banking alliance for net zero, um, which is uh, the biggest of the many kind of finance, finance actor announcements um, that have been pouring out over the past months. These banks control $28 trillion worth of assets. So to the extent they make credible steps toward net zero, that'll be really huge uh, boost for driving the overall financial system toward sustainability and we would hope driving more finance into climate solutions, especially in emerging and developing countries. So still a lot to um, look at in that, that kind of announcement, but potentially quite a significant shift in the economy again, spurred by this summit. So um, even though we know there, uh, there's a lot more work to be done, I was encouraged by the events last week. Thank you, uh, Tom. Ida, Professor Ida, you know that uh, in the summit adaptation was almost crossover though there was a side event uh, there was a um, uh, session on it but uh, the way we see in united nations framework convention adaptation uh, is uh, uh, integral part of uh, say um, other side of the coin um, of uh, mitigation but here uh, the structure um, of the summit didn't hmm, give uh, adaptation that profile. So what is your take? And also as Zohid pointed out that uh, finance for adaptation hmm, was also glossed over. Well, thanks again, Kwamral, for inviting me today. Uh, and for everyone, um, I did earlier put a link in the chat box to an article that my adaptation leader team pulled together uh, specific to adaptation. So that in part is why Quamrel is turning to me because he knows I have something to say about this. Um, so um, <clears throat> among other things, for those who don't know me, I am the past chair uh, in the American Bar Association of the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Committee. I also led the ISO adaptation standards process at the international level for three years. Uh, and I recently- You are a guru. <laughs> stepped, <laughs> stepped, stepped aside as uh, in the United States, the American Society of Adaptation Professionals is the professional society. And I served as their uh, policy chair. So um, among other things in my past, without going into my bio, I did serve as special counsel at US EPA headquarters um, a lifetime ago. Uh, with respect to adaptation, uh, just to share a few quick insights for those of you not familiar with the US domestic situation, uh, as was just pointed out, there's a lot of good work that's been going on on adaptation at the state level business community is getting up to speed on adaptation and resilience. But by and large in the United States, when anyone, and I mean layperson or professional talks about climate action, they are still almost always referring just to mitigation. Adaptation has really not been part of the picture in any significant way. Uh, the Obama administration, um, actually felt pressure from many quarters to not call adaptation adaptation, uh, which is why 
preparedness and resilience became the buzzword, the substitute. And unfortunately, what came away from the meeting last Thursday is it looks like the Biden administration is going to fall into that same uh, trap, I'll call it, of not acknowledging uh, climate adaptation as the co-equal half of the Paris uh, Agreement. The, at the federal level, um, not only did John Kerry's first uh, comments at the international level at the uh, Global uh, Commission meeting in January uh, in the Netherlands uh, lack a familiarity with adaptation, uh, last Thursday, uh, perhaps because the designated co-chairs of the adaptation and resilience session were the agriculture secretary and the homeland security uh, secretary, uh, adaptation was peculiarly framed around land use and security rather than what most of us on this call would recognize as the full scope of adaptation. So we're behind the curve in the US uh, it's a very fragmented uh, community of practice that actually relates more to work that's done under our FEMA uh, emergency response and hazard mitigation terminology than an international level understanding of climate adaptation. There are many of us working hard to overcome that since the summit itself I've had some inquiries from senior US officials who would like to learn more about adaptation. And so I'll leave it on that positive note that we have a lot of ground to make up, uh, but at least there's a willingness to learn. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ira, to flag that point uh, quite eloquently. Uh, I'll come back to you again. Uh, Martin. Um, like as others have said, it's hard to know what I, what I might add to, to the to, to the process. I, I work at a level where it, it sometimes takes quite a long time for these high level summits and their implications to, <laughs> to percolate down to me. Um, I guess uh, as a bit of an introduction, I have an interest in the uh, private sector interaction with uh, the UNFCC on the mitigation side more than anything else. Uh, and so the things I've been looking at are um, how the US has managed to engage in finance and, and, and markets and, and engage their private sector in um, activities. I think the first thing I'd say, like everyone else, one has to welcome, um, a bit like the prodigal son, they came back not once but twice, and uh, they didn't come back empty handed, they, they did come back with those targets. So one has to be uh, to welcome that. Um, and there's a, an, impressive, an impressive range of uh, announcements and activities that they, they've kicked off, of course, the proof of the pudding being in, in the eating. Um, the one that I, I was looking at particularly was uh, one in the area of forestry, which is also not my expertise, but they yeah. assembled uh, a large range of companies to make pledges. ...in and around financing of forestry. And of course, it's something that um, has, has, has its issues, uh, um, but, but I think uh, it's interesting to see that the, you know, they, they've definitely re-entered enthusiastically into, into the debate and, and are bringing um, their uh, diplomacy, finance and, and uh, private sector initiative into this, which uh, I, I certainly find interesting. On a more mundane level, um, just uh, in, in the bilateral interactions that we're having with them, um, uh, in the issues that I discussed, there's a much more positive attitude and a much more positive uh, cooperation in terms of, of things, which of course is welcome. Um, and then I just think I, I would finish uh, in terms of uh, we ourselves in the in before the summit I think was mentioned already uh, adopted our climate act, which I think we're uh, you know that 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 has a longer term perspective on our own emission reductions and something that we. Um, would point to a, a, as, our, as our contribution on top of the 55% legislation that will come out in June. Um, and we will be having a summit. Obviously, uh, President Biden is coming over to the UK to, to Cornwall in June, uh, followed by the NATO summit and the EU US summit. So uh, I'd be watching that going forward. Thanks. Okay. Uh, hope that uh, Brussels meeting will be productive. <laughs> David, or so. 
very briefly <laughs> you take yeah yeah so um yeah so quickly several things and a lot has been covered because, uh, because we have been uh, uh, flagging out uh, this um, and uh, say our take uh, we share um, in very many forms so in very uh, televisions even today we have had that experience both you and me <laughs> Yes. Um, so so a, a lot of ground has been covered. So um, very quickly, I, I think just in terms of the U.S. and the, and the NDC that it put forward, um, the level of ambition is not um, one I think that a lot of observers expected um, even some weeks ago. Um, so that's a very positive sign. And uh, I think one sort of fact, um, one proof point that's important to um, uh, realize as an indicator of that ambition um, is that it will mean effectively de facto no coal any longer in the system as of 2030. Um, I know some observers would rather the U.S. have gone further with the NDC, but I do think it, it did represent quite uh, a substantial degree of ambition, um, as well as being achievable as a number of studies have shown that have come out in the past um, month or so. Um, I think also it, it, it's um, important to um, keep an eye on the other countries that did come forward with increased ambition. So Japan, um, I would say probably um, foremost in that um, with a sort of upper bound, a sort of um, a stretch goal of 50% reductions uh, below 2013 levels. Um, Canada also came forward with an enhanced target for not as strong 40 to 45 percent, but I think also um, as an indicator that the, there's a, a you know a bit of a, a bandwagon around around strengthening ambition, um, and there was the South Korea um, uh, move on international financing of new coal projects. Going forward, I think the question is where where does this take us? I think a lot of eyes are on South Korea as one of the ones that um, should be up. Um, uh, they have a net zero target. So an important question around where they go with their NDC in coming weeks, uh, even I think, um, leading up to the P4G summit. China is, has been mentioned and there are others as well, um, uh, no question. Second thing, just, yeah, I can, I, can, I can end there. I yeah, did just want to um, emphasize, I, I think Paul was exactly right that there was a very heavy emphasis on just transition issues and the social dimension. And, and I think that's an important outcome from the summit to keep moving forward on. Yeah. Uh, you are right. <laughs> Kabe. Thanks, Komo. Um, thanks uh, for having me on. And it's nice to see uh, everyone again. I mean, I, like others, and I, I mean, I really agree with the point made by Zahir. I think we're all looking for positives uh, going forwards. And in that sense, I think the US announcement and the summit definitely has to be welcomed and I think the the glass is looking half full rather than half empty for COP26 yeah. now I think suddenly things feel positive um, in a way that they didn't before but at the same time I agree also with the point that I think we've had enough of summits I don't know how many there have been in the last 12 months but at least five I, that I'm aware of and that we we still remain far off track uh, what we've heard is basically numbers on paper that still need to be translated. I came across, well, I was sent a, a paper by Chatham House uh, a couple of weeks ago before the, before the summit that gave some pretty stark numbers. So this is before the new announcements that there was a 50% probability of more than 2.7 degree warming by the end of the century. 10% um, probability of more than 3.5 degrees by the end of the century. And the chances of staying within 1.5 is less than 1% and of staying below 2 less than 5%. So I think it's, it's good to look at what people have come forward, but in terms of the actual challenge, I think we really haven't grappled with the enormity of the task that's really facing us. And I think Tom made some points there about the, that it's really a transformation of the global economy and of societies that we really haven't begun to grapple with yet. I mean, you saw in France in the last couple of years, just on time to put duty on fuel, uh, it caused riots in the streets. So we really need to find a way of doing this in a way that brings society with us. And I think we have good learning from countries like Poland with the transition from coal, 
in the UK with the citizens' um, panels and juries for how to try to take this forward. So I think the, the real key thing now is that this domestic implementation, you know, as, as others have said, the US has, has um, we've, been, we've been bitten twice and been shy twice by the US with both Kyoto and leaving the Paris Agreement. So the real key now is to put in place the policies to actually deliver. And, you know, when you look at the US uh, cuts, the proposed cuts, it's impressive. But when you look at the per capita emissions, it's slightly less impressive. There's still a long, long way to go. So I think what we really need to see between now and COP26 is the domestic policies to be put in place. And I would just say one thing on adaptation, which has been raised a number of times, having been involved in trying to set up these summits at leader level, the real challenge for adaptation beyond the finance discussion, so finance has to be discussed, but beyond the finance issue, the struggle with adaptation is it is very difficult to frame the discussion in a way that is as tangible as it is in a multilateral context than it is for mitigation. We know what the mitigation gap is, we know what countries need to do. We can applaud when they come forward with new NDCs. But the landscape of adaptation is a lot more fragmented and it's much harder to put a conversation forward that people can rally around on a multilateral level. And that's a challenge that the COP26 presidency is really going to need to deal with for the last year. So uh, thank you uh, for flagging uh, the challenge of uh, adaptation. Uh, that's why under convention, we have um, uh, Cancun adaptation framework and uh, say all countries are going to um, formulate their national adaptation plan, um, NAF. So uh, if uh, NAF is ready for um, all the countries, then also we can assess the adaptation gap and also financing and implementation question is that. And then also we mm, need uh, the technology and we have the technology man, Dr. Raza Kori. So Dr. Kori. Yes. Uh, so uh, say, you know, what is your take? But uh, say, my, adjust my, your camera, adjust your camera. First. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Are you all right? Oh, OK. Uh, Okay, my, my take is, you know, uh, I, you know, the, the pathway, you know, the, the, the leader summit with 40 uh, leaders of 40 countries that uh, was, uh, I mean, uh, uh, organized by the White House is a pathway for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So that means we have to, see that as a pathway, as some speaker has already mentioned, that we have to look at the positive from that uh, summit and see you know, how can we build it up you know, for the Glasgow COP and, and then follow up to, uh, for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So for now, for us, you know, implementation is the, is the most important thing. You know? And if we keep on discussing and negotiating and you know, keep on uh, refining the negotiation, keep on carrying on all these things, you know, who is doing what, how much is this, then nothing will get done. You know, what we should do is just keep on uh, or whatever is there, you know, just in, uh, impress upon the, 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 the parties, you know, or to all the, uh, <clears throat> all the uh, uh, governments and even. Uh, to, to do something, whatever they have committed for the, uh, in the N national NDC, uh, they should uh, come forward and, and implement that. And whatever financial commitment that has been made, you know, that has, should be implemented. I remember uh, uh, we, we were together in, uh, in Copenhagen, you know, when uh, this $100 billion per year by the year 2020 mm -hmm. will be available. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that is available now, you know, you can. Mm -hmm. maybe, no more than I do, you know. So, so okay. that was that was in so, yeah. So that was long time ago, and, and it is not materializing, you know. So we okay. can we can keep on. I'll come back to you again. Yeah, I will come back to you again. Mm. Uh, Katie. <laughs> uh, if, Hi. Uh, if, yeah, <laughs> Katie. Hi. Would um, you like to? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Sure. Well, Carmel, as I mentioned, I'm um, not an expert in the area of climate yeah, yeah. change, and I am I work with private companies in helping them set and implement their land based and biodiversity targets. Yeah. I'm more joining so for synergy, synergy between synergies, and exactly. Exactly, especially as companies move more into um, addressing their scope three, I think it's important for people in the biodiversity world to understand how that intersects with both the international level of discussions about climate change, but also how those will affect companies and their commitments going forward. So thank you very much for the interesting reflections. I found that really helpful to frame how we should, how the movement is happening at the international level at the moment and um, how that might filter down to companies' expectations. So thank you very much, Carol, for having me. Yeah. So uh, now Bryce, Bryce Lalunde. Uh, uh, your wise words. <laughs> okay, well, listen. I'm not, I'm like Marcin Korlek, I'm not anymore a negotiator. <laughs> okay. But you so I'm see, seeing say, things from, from outside. Wisdom. Yeah. Yes. Wisdom. Well, a few things. First, I don't agree with uh, Carré Guillaume mm. It's good we have summits. It's good we have summits because uh, saving the planet and humanity, let's say, is not only a matter for negotiators, it's also a matter for head yeah. of states. It's, it's quite important. And what's, what was good with uh, Biden's summit is that everyone came. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a success. And when everyone comes, it means that uh, in your own country, people are not, are not afraid of competition issues because you can always say, but the others were there also. And it seems for me, there was a, a political tipping point, probably, I hope so in any case, that for the first time countries see that fighting climate change is good for the economy. It's not only a burden. Uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it was a burden for the economy. We have to cut things. We have to get away from fossil fuels. How are we going to do it? Now it's a race. It's a race and it's good for the economy. So it's good for China. It's good for the United States. It's good for everyone. Let's go for it. So I, I, I think this is happening. And uh, Political last... economy of climate change. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you are talking exactly. about political economy of climate change. Exactly. And also because yeah. we have new technologies. I mean, what's new? Um, since um, uh, the Paris Accord is that we are going climate neutral. It's not only about reducing yeah. emissions, which of course is the first step, the most important one, but it's also climate neutral. And climate neutral means we have new technologies now. And it's for the first time in the last five years. Yes, we have CCS now. CCS is implemented in Scotland, in Norway, and we're having carbon removal, carbon removal is probably a new area for the economy. So this is starting right now, and probably this is reflected in, in the optimistic, I mean, so, the sort of Bill Gates, Bill Gates solution um, um, pathway uh, we heard in, in this. Now, the problem is, I want to quote something from a, a very important United States leader. He said, the days of US climate inaction are over. Who said that, yeah. Obama? That was in 2009. And after came Trump. So, they came. so the problem with Biden, he's going to stay for only four years. Yeah. He's in a hurry. You must hurry up. Yeah. And he wants to get things irreversible. And as it usually is with the United States, it's not yeah. multilateral. They don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't much like the multilateral process. It takes yeah. too, like, too, too much time. They like the, yeah. remember the MEF, Major Economies Forum. Yeah. They like that because it's easier. It goes faster. It's going to be like in Copenhagen, a, a big... Yeah. Head of states are going to agree, and after it's going to be very difficult to get it into the multilateral process. But I mean, that's that's the problem. Biden has no internal legislation to, to do this. Okay. He's not going to pass by a legislation. It's not going to be binding. It's going to be with a new huge uh, infrastructure program, which is already called by the Republicans. Oh, it's a, it's a green deal in disguise. So it's not going to be so easy. So we must understand that. Uh, and, yeah. and, now, yeah. and also, uh, Bryce, you yes. remember in Kyoto also, uh, sure. Al Gore sure. came to us and said that uh, they can't mm, pass it from their uh, Congress. Yes, so, and remember, uh, yes, Kyoto exactly. Protocol uh, should be flexible one, not exactly. a no exactly. more And we, we made uh, that concession, but uh, even then uh, they have withdrawn. 
And, so and, and, that is part of life. But the, we the European Union, another withdrawal yes. of United States. <laughs> exactly. So the European Union I came like with to, a price yeah. on carbon. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and Gore said, oh, no, let's have a market. And we yeah. agreed. And they did not agree anymore. OK, there we are. Yeah. OK, well, thank you. Uh, so I would now like to uh, return to Bangladesh Environment and Climate Secretary uh, Ziaul Hassan, NDC, uh, because LDCCR also you know, passed on a request uh, that you also take his time. <laughs> Ziaul Hassan. I think you have to unmute. Okay, thank you so much uh, for uh, providing an opportunity to join me with a, uh, a good number of very expert and experienced uh, negotiators. Uh, much has been talked uh, about the uh, outcome of the Joe Biden uh, leader summit. Uh, like others, uh, I appreciate the uh, unveiling the leader summit by uh, President Joe Biden. Uh, at least he has uh, been able to take uh, take on board all the potential uh, heads of states, heads of governments, to uh, come to a realization that the they need to take appropriate action uh, to mitigate uh, or curtail carbon emission in the uh, coming days. Uh, some of the countries have already uh, announced their enhanced uh, ambition, and some others, uh, uh, some others uh, are yet to announce their. Uh, uh, announced their uh, ambition. Hopefully, all the major economies who are mainly uh, responsible for the devastating uh, climate situation will uh, come to understand the severity uh, because of their. Uh, because of, uh, of their uh, emission, and they, they will come forward to uh, solve the problem as soon as possible. As a climate vulnerable country, Bangladesh is uh, Bangladesh is hopeful that uh, the collective cooperation or collective effort of all the nations, including the uh, major economies of the countries will come to a consensus and do uh, immediate appropriate action pleases and will go for implementing those pieces on the ground. Uh, in the leader summit, our uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina uh, underscored the need for uh, global uh, participation in the efforts to combat climate change. Uh, he, is, he mentioned that in Bangladesh, we are spending uh, about 2.5% of our GDP amounting to uh, 5 billion uh, Bangladeshi currencies a year. And we need to have uh, uh, technology and finance to adapt to the already happening climatic situation. And we need to have a a 50% share for adaptation. And Bangladesh, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister also iterated that Bangladesh is planning to uh, advance on a clean, clean development pathway. And for that, we need to have development of appropriate technology and transfer of that technology and, uh, and, and finance. Uh, as a climate vulnerable country, we are fighting against the uh, effects of climate change every day. Uh, so, unless also 
unless and until and we have uh, so many other priorities other than the combating climate change so uh, we are fully committed to uh, to be in partnership with the global community to reduce our sufferings to take part in in uh, global effort uh, to mitigate the impacts of climate change but we have our limitations in terms of our finance in terms of, in terms of our capacity and technology and that is to be rendered uh, by the uh, advanced industrial countries as they are placed under uh, as they are committed or obligated by the uh, Paris agreement and uh, we have already uh, used loss and damage has been incurred due to uh, climate, uh, climate change. And we need, to, uh, we need to have compensation uh, for our huge loss and damage because yeah, uh, already uh, a substantial portion of our uh, citizens have been migrated from the, particularly from the coastal regions and uh, from the uh, plant prone areas, also for some uh, landslide prone hilly areas, they have been migrated elsewhere. So to uh, appropriately rehabilitate them and a better living uh, condition for them, we have to have uh, 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 the uh, resolve the uh, issue of loss and damage uh, well the uh, the the issue of loss and damage. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, we are uh, we are hoping the best uh, for the that the uh, the uh, the majority communities will contribute uh, in both ways uh, for the for mitigation and also for uh, for adaptation because uh, it is the it is the uh, it is the it is due to their uh, contribution that we are suffering due to climatic uh, climatic adverse situation, uh, and uh, so that is their primary duty. But uh, to uh, to get out of the of the uh, own. Uh, development or uh, with, uh, domestic activities, they need to uh, consider the sufferings the, of, the, of the people of the climate vulnerable countries. And in the process, in, the, in doing so, they must support the climate vulnerable countries with adequate finance, uh, development of appropriate uh, physical technologies, and transport these technologies to the climate vulnerable countries and to address uh, our long pending loss and damage issue. So, uh, for, so this is what I want to expect uh, from, the, the, from the summit and the, from the intervention of the development, developed nations. Thank you, uh, Secretary. Uh, Tom. Tom. So, would you like to say now? Should I come in again on the summit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, say how do we uh, move ahead? Move to uh, uh, Glasgow. Yeah. Our so road to Glasgow and beyond. So one issue I'm particularly excited about to think more about is how we move, make this much discussed shift to implementation. Uh, um, and you now have our say what are the challenges of say uh, incoming COP president Olok? Well, I think it's this: how we, how this COP can be actually deliver on this idea of pivoting yeah, right. implementation. This is deliver a, in terms of say Article Six, market mechanism, non-market mechanism, uh, carbon pricing rule. Hmm. Uh, framework, uh, keeping the integrity mm, of the market mm, and also mobilization of uh, support, uh, technology, capacity building, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, net zero. Yes, no, I think all, all of those are you know, important in the 
in the outcomes for the cup. I do think though, you know, to, I do think this cup will be really marked though, Commonwealth, if it succeeds in making this pivot to implementation yeah. as a cup. And we have, we have cups now, this is very, very much being cast as an ambition cup. People are talking about it as the net zero cup. Hi, we, need, we, need we, we, we say, you know, you know, our convention language, we say high cup and low cup. <laughs> this Indeed. is a high cup. And in fact, this has turned into a, the, say, more high cup. <laughs> It's the Indeed. extra high cup. <laughs> Indeed, no, well, every, every, um, all the new urgency makes it even higher and higher. So, so I think, you know, really what people will be looking for is can there be results? People will be, are now more, because the urgency is so much higher, are suspicious and are unimpressed by pledges, are unimpressed by even negotiated outcomes. What they want to see is action and results. And I think that the COP will really need to begin to um, think about how COPs in general, but this COP in particular, can be venues that are driving forward concrete actions and results um, as much as pledges and negotiated outcomes. Um, so I'm hoping we'll be able to see some real outcomes, for example, on electric vehicles, on finance for, for nature-based solutions and finance for adaptation, um, on things like the energy transition. These are all specific areas that the COP presidency has elevated as key outcomes. And I do think that if it can show, here's some proof points for how we're actually um, better off than we were a year ago on the fight against climate change, that'll be really critical for success. Thank you. Paul. Well, <laughs> looking forward for the rest of the year. Yeah, looking the, forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, not only rest of the year and year beyond. Uh, beyond, uh, say, I, I, because we need up, to implement it. We need to uh, say ensure that Paris Agreement is fully implemented. Paris Agreement uh, is your baby. So, yeah. how well, to manage that? <laughs> I, I mean, first of all, yes, it is. Uh, it's getting a bit, it's growing up a bit now, and it's. Uh, uh, getting a lot more people looking after it, and uh, so that's good. Um, I mean, I mean, clearly the, there are some many deliverables for for Glasgow, and I, I don't think it's helpful to get into the details of of that now. I think what's really interesting is the dynamic moving from the summit throughout the year in terms of building support for for implementation and action. Uh, it's not just enough to have nice announcements, it's the real delivery of those which will matter as we move forward on mitigation. Adaptation has been stressed with loss and damage by many of you, uh, and clearly on the mobilization of finance. And then into the real world, uh, uh, as negotiators, we spend far too much time out of the real world. Uh, and it's really mobilizing with the, the actors from the business community, from local government, from the many others who populated the uh, action agenda as we put it together in Paris and has been moving forward since, where a lot of the real delivery can be done. And it was interesting to see the US positioning itself and in, in, in the summit, and we see the UK preparing COP26 also uh, giving a, a lot of space to the sort of implementation side around specific um, themes and deliverables. So I think it's gonna to have to be in all of these levels. And I think at the same time as we're trying to rebuild bet, back better uh, our economies and our societies from COVID-19, we also need to, to try and, and improve and build back better our own multilateral processes. Because let's face it, Madrid, I have fairly painful memories of the Madrid as I, I suspect some others may share too, um, was not the, the, did not put our process in the best light. And I think there's a real need as we move forward to find ways of greatly making our process much better adapted, uh, much fitter uh, for the roles it needs to play in the future. We need multilateral processes in the midst of all the, uh, the rest of these actors. But if it works like it did in Madrid, frankly, people will start to get frustrated. As, as Brice was saying, the US way of seeing, others will start to get frustrated with it too. So we do need to strengthen that. Okay. Pretty. Pretty bears. Are you here? Pretty. Peter Bers? No. Ira? Ira? Okay, Martin. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Paul was talking about Madrid. Certainly, it was painful for for me. We had we had a discussion that went on far too long, and even appeared on the comedy shows to 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 make fun of us. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I I take completely that we need to move to, towards implementation. But I think I think from my point of view, implementation quite happens happens at home. You go home and you make sure that you make you do make good on on pledges. Um, and there are some boring, dull areas of the of, of the Paris Agreement and other agreements that are, are about reporting on your implementation and the MRV and responsibility for implementation, which I think um, quite often gets forgotten because it's seen as, as kind of worthy and, and rather dry. But actually, that's what drives um, countries to, to forward. We have the big political events, um, but we also have um, on, a, on a, a lower civil servant level and a... a other levels, we have to report back on what we've done to deliver on what we promised. And if there's nothing to, to report, that's that's at least embarrassing. So I think um, those uh, workaday items on uh, transparency and the implementation of the transparency framework, and uh, dare I say it, the implementation of Article 6, and countries actually going back and delivering on what they've promised and reporting back uh, on how they've done it. And I'm sure it's true in the area of finance and adaptation. Um, they are key. Um, and I do hope that we we go there with a spirit of compromise, unlike perhaps we, we've 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 seen uh, in, in recent COPs, and and maybe that's the the, the sign that you know um, let let's just say that multilateralism was very much under attack um, for the last few years. We we have a, a, a shift in the U.S. in terms of a, a commitment to multilateralism again. It's not universal, um, but but hopefully we will we will come together and deliver a, a multilateral solution because of that political shift that we've seen in the US. Thank you, Martin. Gabriel. Gabriel. Thanks, uh, Cuomo. I mean, I, I agree with the points that Tom, Paul, and, and Martin have made. Uh, I mean, I think the UNFCCC and COP26, it really, I, I do think it needs to support the implementation agenda and really to pivot to that, that way of thinking. You know, with, with this summit that was convened by Biden, President Biden, we saw uh, somewhere between a 10 and 14 percent improvement in ambition on 2030 targets. That had absolutely nothing directly to do with the UNFCCC process. That was the, the wider framework and it was the politics between capitals. Of course, the Paris Agreement sets the, the background against which that happened, but it wasn't negotiated. And I think if the COP doesn't pivot towards supporting that implementation through the elevation of the action agenda to being, I think, the main show in, in, for the COP, but also the, the technical and boring parts that Martin has alluded to that allow us to track progress, then I think the UNFCCC really risks irrelevance compared to that bilateral um, and multilateral process between capitals, which I think would be a shame. I think the COP presidency has a really big challenge on its hands because many of the political deliverables will be known way before the first day of the COP. Uh, and that combined with a COP that is very significant in terms of the calendar gives a real challenge for the COP26 presidency. But I think it would be a real shame if the whole of this year was characterized by whether or not Article 6 is agreed or not at COP26. We really cannot yeah. move towards that kind of dynamic and see the context in a, in a much wider perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, it was a great pleasure to have you all mm, uh, in this episode and all hands on the deck. Uh, and climate change should be mm, front of the mind. And the real question mm, before uh, our incoming co president, Olof, is um, there are a policy pathway to get mm, to Glasgow and beyond because we have to implement the Paris Agreement effectively, fully, adequately, so that we can reach 1.5 degree temperature regime. And we have to keep that vision alive. The real question is the rubber meets the road, fire it meets the road. So with that, I would now like to close this episode and it was really great pleasure to have you all from uh, our co-president 
COP19 President Merkel to Rice Lavender, who was a veteran, Peter Bess, another veteran, and Paul, Ambassador France, Martin Kabe, Dr. Emma Sadhus Jaman, Dr. Rezaul Karim, Thomas, Ira, Vasco, and Katie. So thank you all, and also Bangladesh Permanent Secretary for Environment and Climate Change, Ziyad Hassan, for your participation and for your day, for your assessment. You have really unfact and Zahir Fakir unfact what happened in Climate Leaders Summit. And hopefully, Glasgow will be successful. We will meet again in our any of the next episodes. Thank you. Thank you from Climate Center. Top investors putting climate change high on their agendas, more tech companies are launching software that can help oil and gas producers keep track of their carbon footprint and show investors they are serious about controlling emissions. Software giants SAP and Salesforce have both launched carbon emissions accounting systems. Salesforce said it has customers from 10 industries. Smaller startups like Persephone are getting involved too. The Arizona.